In crypto in 2023, it's easy to get caught up in focusing on tiny details about cutting edge technology or ideas. But it also may have been true since the birth of crypto that the best, most accessible basic crypto infrastructure will always determine the winners. Cardano seems very well off in this regard versus its biggest competitors. Ready? Let's go. Today, we are going to discuss the infrastructure of Cardano's biggest competitor once again living up to its reputation, some surprising stats on deliveries by Catalyst-funded projects, people speculating about an eventual marriage of AI and crypto, and crypto's worst enemy not getting any love from the online public. If you feel like this is some kind of fake fantasy city that actually doesn't need any infrastructure at all because it seems to have no traffic, or if you're finding value in these videos each weekday, please consider delegating to the Army of Spies stake pool, ticker AOS. You're probably aware that one of the biggest things going on in the entire crypto world right now is the Ethereum withdrawal event. We talked about this a little bit yesterday. It looks like this isn't going quite as seamlessly and effortlessly as some might lead us to believe. So here's the account of a pretty big Ethereum poster. So you can see 150,000 followers, Ethereum since 2014, Ethereum Improvement Proposal 1559, co-author, staker, angel investor, a dot ETH username. This is someone who is obviously very involved in the Ethereum ecosystem. Here's what he has to say about the ETH withdrawal process. Sure, staked ETH is technically unlocked, but it takes an air-gapped computer and a PhD in Linux, CLI, and BLS to actually get it out. Did you account for this in your bear case, Anon? And you might assume he's not actually being serious here. So someone asked him, I don't understand if it's sarcasm or you really had a bad time updating that withdrawal address. He asked both. Can it be both? He is being a little sarcastic, but he also had a bad time with this whole withdrawal process. And you can see here, they sort of go on to, you know, sort of debate this technical process that they have to go through to make this happen. And people are showing, you know, what percentage of the ecosystem has actually done what it needs to do to make this whole this whole withdrawal thing happen. But needless to say, it turns out that this is not quite the effortless, straightforward process that I think we've been led to believe by some. And this is a pretty big contrast to what we see in Cardano. In Cardano, as a validator, as a st stake pool operator, sure, you have to have a little bit of maybe technical aptitude and there's a little bit of work involved. You've kind of got to stay on top of what's happening in the ecosystem. We do have these hard fork combinator events. We have smaller upgrades. Uh, the node is constantly being upgraded, things like that. But we don't really see this level of this level of difficulty to just, you know, make the normal kinds of things in the chain happen. And we Traditionally, we've seen a lot of people complain about Cardano, how things are difficult in Cardano. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that we have a functional programming language, Haskell, that is a basis for our smart contract programming language, which is Plutus. And granted, you know, it's hard to deny. There are a lot more programmers outside of functional programming than there are inside of functional programming. That's a whole nother conversation, Cardano and its smart contract programming language, which we've had a million times on this channel. Luckily, we have some things here now and coming like Aiken that are gonna make it a lot easier for non-functional programmers to do things in Cardano. None of that really applies to this though. This is just the basic infrastructure of the chain. Ethereum has gone through this transformation from a proof of work chain to a proof of stake chain. And what do we see here? We see Ethereum people making the same kind of complaints about Ethereum that people have sometimes made about Cardano, that it's difficult, that it's not straightforward, that uh, they wish there were better instructions. It turns out that these kinds of complaints are really maybe 
a lot to do with just the nature of distributed systems. Maybe it's just a general blockchain ecosystem thing because blockchains are these distributed systems. It's very different than a centralized system where you have a centralized party that has sort of their own little walled garden and the users are sort of directly interacting with infrastructure being run by the centralized party. You know, maybe that's you know, name, name your, name your legacy tech project. If you're interacting with something run by Google, if you're interacting with something run by Meta or Adobe, you know, any of your old school tech projects, the paradigm was the user uses infrastructure that's being run by one centralized party. And it's a lot easier in some cases for a centralized party to maintain that infrastructure. When you get into the world of distributed systems, though, you've got the infrastructure being maintained and, you know, the the blockchain itself being um, being the block production being executed by a million random people. It's no longer a centralized party. And there are some good things and bad things about that. Uh, sometimes when you have a distributed system, in a way you can be almost more nimble, which is kind of counterintuitive because there's no giant bu bureaucracy. One validator can just do what they need to do. They don't need to ask anyone's permission and uh, deal with you know uh, governance by committee that can sometimes happen with large bureaucracies, like with a large centralized entity. They can just kind of do what needs to be done. They can be very nimble. But at the same time, You've got a million people because it's a distributed system all trying to do their own thing. And while they can be more nimble than sort of a bureaucracy laden centralized corporate party, you've also got to worry about a million different parties all figuring out what they need to do and how to do it. I think that's what we encounter a lot of times in crypto in general. But the good thing about Cardano is that we've kind of already gone through all the growing pains of building out this proof of stake infrastructure that can be maintained pretty easily. Like right now, I think validation in Cardano is pretty good. We haven't had the kinds of problems that blockchains like Solana have with you know having to turn the blockchain on and off. We don't have those problems at all. And we don't have to, we haven't had to have these big events because we were transitioning from proof of work to proof of stake. We don't have um, uh, a system that only works because it's reinforced by slashing. So we don't have to worry about any kind of mass slashing events. Cardano has been built out to be, to run well, the basic infrastructure. You could argue maybe it's, it's difficult to get projects made in Cardano right now because they largely have to be done by people with functional programming experience that's all changing like i said with new programming languages like aiken but right now you could argue that about projects but the basic infrastructure in cardano runs pretty well and when i think about what's going to onboard mainstream people normal users in the next cycle it's probably going to be those things are probably going to rely heavily on the basic infrastructure in the ecosystem running well. I mean, I don't think a brand new user to crypto, I don't think they're going to be, I, th I think the kinds of things they're going to want to use, someone on day one of crypto, they're not going to be doing the most sophisticated thing in the blockchain ecosystem necessarily, the most cutting edge, craziest futuristic project they may not be doing that they may not they may be doing the basic things and you know sending ada to other people using crypto for the first time wallets that work well we discussed last night how it looked like the uh, lace wallet is currently tuned to those kinds of new users and iog has told us how uh, they're going to be adding all kinds of functionality on a three to six week release basis, you know, on a schedule of releases every three to six weeks. So we'll see a lot more from Lace, but it's kind of tuned to those basic users. It's tuned to be a good wallet that can interact with the infrastructure at a basic level for new users to onboard all those new mainstream users in the next cycle. I think the Cardano infrastructure as a whole has sort of been tuned to the same thing to work really, really well at the core functions of a blockchain. And we've got a lot more stuff to do with, you know, scaling and uh, with um, with governance, things like that. But I think what will onboard people 
in the next big wave of adoption is probably just the basic blockchain running really, really well. And at this point, it's kind of hard to say that any other top 10 blockchain ecosystem has a blockchain that runs as well as Cardano. You probably know that I generally don't like to comment on crypto market issues, but as a spectator, it is kind of interesting to note here that the Ethereum community seems to be very split on what the effect of this withdrawal will be. Here we see one end of the spectrum. This poster says, good morning, fellow bears, still short and strong, not yet invalidated. Trillions of ether in the withdrawal queue waiting to be sold adding to shorts, they won't trap me. And then you've got other very substantial portions of the Ethereum population who are sort of relieved saying, this is so great, no one is selling. No one is selling, withdrawals are open and we haven't seen that massive sell-off that the bears are predicting. So just purely as a spectator, it's kind of entertaining to watch the two sides sort of debate what what the future is actually going to look like as a result of this withdrawal finally happening. Here are some very interesting stats on Catalyst that might kind of defy the commonly accepted wisdom a little bit. So Daniel says, about 500 projects have arguably delivered on the scope of their deliverables from the pool of 1.1 thousand total allocations. The first funds were distributed in January 2021. That gives us a bit over a two-year timeline. Naturally, there isn't a 100% success rate, which would be a utopia, but I reckon there's a lot of goodness there. And then he gives you a link where you can find more details. This is kind of interesting because people talk about Catalyst as if we've got sort of like a 10% or 1% success rate. But here he's saying that about, you know, almost half of the projects have arguably delivered something that's in the scope of the expected deliverables. I'm putting a few words in his mouth here, but I think that's the gist of what he's saying. And he points out, We've it's been two years and we've gone through a lot of iterations of Catalyst. This is actually a much better number. This is a much better percentage than I would have expected. And of course, people will quibble quibble about you know which pro what number of projects actually delivered enough of their deliver deliverables to say that that was a substantial success. But if it's anything on the order of these numbers here, actually, I think uh, our success rate on Catalyst is a lot better than you would gather from a lot of the comments that kind of float around the community. Here's something kind of interesting, but maybe predictable. I mean, the fact that these two, these two areas of technological advance have seem to have some some commonalities between them at least the communities who are very enthusiastic about these two areas of progress seem to have some commonalities so this poster says the great merge event of 2029 was not clear in 2023 few could understand how personal ai and bitcoin would essentially become one entity nor could they have understood why in 2023. So obviously, this is a little bit, um, this is a little bit, little bit tongue in cheek. Um, someone down here comments, "Why does my personal AI require a trustless payment system?" And the original poster says, "Nate, interesting. Let us see." But this is kind of interesting. I think I've seen um, a surprising number of of social media posts like this, where people are obviously trying, people have this like feeling, they have this almost subconscious feeling that there's going to be some kind of a nexus, some kind of interplay between AI and the crypto world. And of course, we'll have all kinds of projects in crypto that are AI related and all kinds of AI projects that are crypto related. We'll, we'll have that kind of uh that kind of sort of exchange between these two sort of, you know, uh, ecosystems. But I, I, I kind of, I've always had this feeling that there would be something more than that. Like in the past, I've always joked on this channel that I don't care what the AI does as long as it demands to be paid in Cardano in ADA. That's always been my, my one expectation. Like I don't, I don't really care if the AI, uh, is super useful to us or super threatening to us as long as it demands all of its either payments or you know ransom payments in uh, in Cardano. But it does it it has kind of made sense to me when I think about like uh, if the AI is sort of if the AI we end up with is sort of all knowing and you know more intelligent than any human, and we're also right that crypto is the best money, the money that the most intelligent 
parties would choose, then hopefully, if all those things line up, AI will definitely choose crypto as its preferred money. It seems logical to me. If you're the if you're the smartest, you know, possibly sentient, possibly not sentient organism, you know, on this planet, then why would you choose the money that is under the control of a central bank who may debase that money when you could choose a hard capped cryptocurrency like Bitcoin or especially like ADA? Finally, you might find this amusing. People are pointing out that while Gary Gensler has over a quarter million followers, he makes a post like this about the 70th birthday of the James Bond novels, and he only gets a couple hundred likes. So this this should be a sign to the current administration that when you've got when you've got a government official with this many followers and he's only getting this many likes, it may be a reflection of people not liking the way you're treating certain issues. Probably chief among them in this case are the issues related to crypto. I think the current administration can take this as a sign that people probably in the US, but also around the world, don't appreciate the way you're treating this nascent new industry, this cutting edge technological industry that's only only about you know a little over a decade old. We're still pretty young and we're uh, we're pushing the technology of money forward pretty fast. It looks like the people of the world don't appreciate the way you are trying to strangle that industry in the grave. But I hope you had a good week. I hope you're getting ready for a great spring weekend. I think for a lot of people in the Northern Hem Hemisphere, we're sort of coming into the the nice warm, warming at least, weekends of spring. I hope you've got some nice plans maybe to get outside. And I will talk to you soon.